those of you who are joining us, thank you and welcome, welcome to this this round table. So this session is going to be it's the day two of the API journey. So we are discussing that APIs are APIs are not a new topic, obviously, uh, and most businesses are well into their API journey. But what's changing that you should be planning for, uh, and how can you evolve your current API platform to be ready for these new initiatives and these new changes? And how can you have a strategy that goes beyond reacting to compliance requirements and creates a flexible and essential part of your of your business? So these are some of the questions that we'll be discussing this session. Um, we have two experienced API leaders here joining us, and they will talk about where we've come from and where we're going. So I thought we'll start with a little bit of an introduction to get to know who everyone is. So I can go first, and then I'm going to hand over to, to our speakers. So my name is Jannika Aldo. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And I work with Platformable. And uh, Platformable is a platform that supports the growth of open ecosystems across some key sectors like open finance, banking, health, digital, uh, open governments, and open sustainability. And we measure the value that those open ecosystems create. So whether that's financial value or, or social value or environmental value. And I work as a systems lead and open sustainability program lead um, in, that, in that team. And then let's go to our speakers. Anne-Marie, do you want to start? Sure. My name is Anne-Marie Bond. I work in the product marketing organization for Software AG. And I focus on our web methods platform which is an integration API, B2B, and MFT platform. It's a hybrid platform in the cloud and on-premise. And with web methods, you can connect to anything, anywhere. Um, my name is Mirch Aydonat. I'm a senior product manager at Software AG. Um, I product manage the web methods API management suite, which Anne-Marie just gave a brief introduction for. Great, thank you both. I'm very happy to have you have you here. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. So uh, those of you who are joining, you have the, the chat on the right hand side. So feel free to take part in the conversation, introduce yourself. If you have any questions that come up during this session, mm -hmm. now, note down your questions in the in the chat. And then we hope to have a little bit of time in the end where we can discuss some, some of these, these audience questions. Um, and we have 25 minutes for this session and um, let's get started. So the first question I have for both of you, Anne-Marie and Merit, um, how long have you worked in the technology, technology industry and how have you seen the role of women in APIs change and evolve? Anne-Marie, why don't you go first? Yeah, I can give that, I can, I can start. I've been in technology a long time. I majored in computer science in college and I worked as a developer for many, many years. And then when I came to web methods, um, I moved to pre-sales and pre-sales is, um, it's, it's sort of like um, technology on steroids because you're doing everything in front of a customer mm. um, and you know under under a lot of pressure and it's a really good experience to understand really out out in the world what kinds of issues are customers encountering and how are they solving them and what do they really need to help them so that was a that was a wonderful experience, and then I moved into um, product management as a, a more strategic approach to the products that I was selling, and now I'm in product marketing. Um, as a as a woman in a technology field, um, you know, historically, uh, I'm I'm one of a very few. So there are a lot of times that I've been the only person in the room, uh, the only woman in the room. Um, for the most part, I think it's been, uh, you know, I, I find that I'm very well respected by my male, male colleagues, but, you know, maybe 10 years ago, um, you know, things would happen like I would get assigned, you know, the note taking duties or, or mm -hmm. something like that. And that kind of thing, I just have to, um, I have to say, you know, I learned to stay focused on sort of the goals of the company, the strategic goals of the company and uh, you know, try not to get uh, sidetracked or pigeonholed. Uh, and that helped keep me um, sort of on track with uh, my male colleagues and able to, you know, sort of stay, stay current and stay on par and, mm -hmm. and, you know, get the, you know, the kind of, you know, respect and opportunities that you want to have as you're 
developing as a as a technology professional yeah yeah and clearly that's taken you a long way so i'm glad that things have evolved from the note taking yeah um, yeah, that has happened. Yeah, <laughs> that was a long time ago, though. <laughs> um, thank you. What about you, Marich? Um, I've been in technology since 2010. I also started as a developer in the semiconductor industry. And then in 2016, I made my way into APIs. Mm -hmm. And comparing my experience in APIs versus semiconductors, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, we have some we have more representation in, in APIs. So since the day that I joined in the like since the day that I started my own API journey, I've met some amazing engineering managers, developers, designers, I don't know, like marketers, product managers who happen to be female. And uh, I've been sort of impressed by the representation in API. I guess there's something about APIs that uh, attract more females. And uh, compared to my experience in semiconductors where like I was the only female in the room, I think um, APIs is in a good place. And um, I hope that we're going to have some more representation to uh, mimic the general po population out there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you. And it seems like it's definitely a situation that's evolving and changing where we're constantly making progress. Sure. So that's, that's really good to see. And it's nice to have both of you here in this session talking about a topic like this. Um, next question I have for, for you, Anne-Marie. So um, if you implemented APIs last year, you already know how to create, deploy, and secure them. Uh, what does that mean you should be thinking about for next year? Good question. So I think um, you know a lot of times it's easy to think that when you've deployed your API, you're done. Mm. Um, but these days, APIs are more than just kind of a, you know, a, a technology item that just operates in the background. Um, in many cases, APIs are um, the, the leading edge of what a company is looking to um, create to leapfrog the competition. And that means you have to align with the business and you have to treat APIs as a product. And we've seen that with customers like UK Army where they came to us and said, you know, we need to, we need to fix a problem we have with not, um, you know, not being able to pay our reservists quickly enough. Uh, you know, and the way that we worked on it is we looked at it as an API project where we were able to expose a bunch of application data and services in the back end in a secure way and just create a very simple service to make that happen. Uh, but that's what APIs can do as long as you treat them as a business priority and not as a technology item. And that means looking at governance and visibility so you can maintain quality as more of your APIs get added, getting away from siloed line of business type API creation. It means understanding who's using them and why, thinking about your developer ecosystem, You know, as your APIs get adopted by developers, who's adopting them, what problems are they having? What are they using them for? Um, and then even if you want to think a little farther into the future, mm -hmm. APIs are a great tool for creating apps in the cloud. Um, and the other way that apps in the cloud are being created is with microservices. And a lot of times we're seeing microservices as the backend services that are providing the data for those APIs at the front end of apps. And when they work together in the cloud, there's not always a good way to manage them. We have service mesh for microservices and we have API gateways for APIs. So think about how you're going to manage those things together, not just deploy them, but, but manage them and operate them over time for stability, reliability, um, and be able to you know, really have, have visibility into what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. that's, part, that's all part of the roadmap that you need to plan for. Great, great, thank you. So having a bit more of a holistic forward thinking view rather than treating it as an afterthought, seems Thanks. like a great, thank you. Um, next question I have for you, Merit. So today um, you probably have a canned API portal or, already where you publish your APIs. Uh, and from your view and your experience, how is publishing APIs changing and why is that? Yeah, sure. Um, API portals have been around for a while, and they've been an integral part of the API economy. It's where people um, advertise their APIs. It's 
where they create the marketplace and generate the developers for their APIs. And so far, organizations, like you said, had a can't option to, um, to create an API portal where um, sometimes this was like a content management system, for example, by a third party, where, which was really designed for a totally different application. Or uh, API management providers like provided this static API portal that didn't leave much room for independence and flexibility. But what we've been hearing from our customers lately is that they want that flexibility and they have their unique needs. And one of these unique needs have been, uh, for example, something that seems as minor as the ability to use the brand colors. Mm -hmm. But in reality, this is a very difficult case to implement. Or we've been also hearing some requirements that they want to use the portal as an engine only and build their own front end by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, so far the Kent API portals have been giving everybody like sort of like a one size fits all box and putting everybody there. But everybody wants to like our customers now that they're further in their API journey, they want to create custom and compelling portals for their organizations. Mm. So, and another need that we've been seeing, seeing is I think what's where the API portals are going to go is that um, it's going to be a portal for different types of assets, like B2B assets, like connectors, like, um, I don't know, like events, all sorts of different assets combining in a single portal. So I think it's a really exciting time for portals. And that's why, like, after seeing all of these requirements from our customers, from our field folks, We've created the developer portal and released it recently. Mm -hmm. So what you can do with the developer portal is that we are giving you the engine that you can use and create your own front end and interact with the engine by using its APIs. Mm -hmm. So all the feature functionality are available th through the APIs. Or you can also use the user interface that we're shipping which is highly customizable and easily customizable that organizations can create their own uh, front ends. Mm. So as I said, like it's a very exciting um, time for API portals, which are evolving into portals that are like more than APIs. And I think like all, all organizations should uh, start setting up their API programs to um, confirm to these changes. Mm. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, continuing with you, another question that we have is, is um, you know, I'm sure our participants here, you already have APIs. You have consumers who are using these APIs. Uh, how can you increase the awareness and adoption of these APIs from your experience? Yeah, that's a very good question because organizations invest all this money into APIs and um, they certainly don't want their investment to go to waste. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important aspect of um, creating awareness and adoption is to first to have very good quality APIs and second to have um, uh, to generate an ecosystem of users early on. So and both of these requirements sort of combine um, and get a solution through hackathons and beta programs. So you can start these types of programs to like, even before you go to production with your APIs to um, gain some developers and hackers into your ecosystem and gather feedback about APIs. So they can let you know what works, what doesn't work. They can let you know about bugs. Um, they can let you know about, you know, you know, you created this API, but it doesn't really, it's not really useful. Or my favorite of all is that they can create applications that you hadn't thought about before using your data. Mm. So getting that sort of like early feedback and engagement is a great way to generate your ecosystem, like a core group of developers and hackers that have already invested in your APIs. Mm. So, and I think that ties well to do theme of the conference here, which is open banking. So 
the whole point of open banking itself is to open up the data to a greater number of users, a greater number of application developers, so that the end users can gain more value. So it's like a win-win-win situation. So what I'm saying is that why wait until production, but just why not do all of these before you go to production to create that core set of users and gain some early early intuition into like how your API is going to perform. So that's why I think hackathons or beta programs are really important. Yeah, that's I love that. It's a really, really good insight. It's kind of like harnessing the the principles of of the openness of the entire industry. I've, that's a really, really good idea. I love it. Exactly. Um, great. So one more question for you then we have is uh, we've seen uh, API standards evolve from SOAP to RESC to CraftQL. Um, why would companies move to these new standards? Or why should yeah. they? Um, yeah, so APIs are everywhere now. Like there are organizations that generate the most of their revenue through APIs, like, I don't know, like Expedia or eBay, or there are some organizations which gain users or collect data through APIs that bring them indirect revenue. And if you, Think about these different use cases. There's there's a whole different spectrum uh, with organizations that have different needs and requirements from their API programs. So mm -hmm. that's why, again, like they like putting everybody in the same spot and giving them all the same tools to uh, apply to their use case doesn't really make sense here. So we've had um, like some organizations that have some higher security requirements, some have more flexibility requirements, some have lower bandwidth requirements. So all of these different API standards respond to these different requirements. And one thing that we have been seeing with uh, GraphQL is that there are those organizations that have more flexibility requirements. So in, in GraphQL, what you're allowed to do is to create a query and then get all the data that you need in a single shot. Mm -hmm. So you can design your own API call per se. Whereas in REST, in order to get the same data, you might have to make like different API calls to different methods and then combine all of that data. Mm -hmm. So GraphQL gives you that flexibility to um, do like a one shot API call to get everything that you need. And we've seen some organizations um, needing that flexibility. And that's why um, uh, we are also supporting GraphQL in our latest release uh, that we released this month. Nice. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us along as we have about five minutes left of this session. So we have an interesting question from the audience it has to do with open banking, open finance. And this would be... Um, I guess mainly for you, marriage, but also Anne Marie, feel free to to chime in if you but from your from your experience. So thinking about the next ten years, how do you see open banking evolution have taking place? What are some of the challenges that you see in the next or foresee in the next ten years? And what changes on the regulation do you think are needed to really boost that space and that growth? So yeah, Marich, why don't you start briefly with an overview and then if Anne-Marie, you want to add something. Um, you no, know, what I'm just going to say is that uh, we have an amazing uh, speaker tomorrow um, at 2 p.m. BST, um, whose name is Matthias Peel. And he's going to talk about like everything about open banking and API strategies for banks and fintechs. So uh, I think users who are, uh, or uh, viewers who are interested in um, that type of open banking um, information and insights should definitely tune in to watch that talk. Yeah, open banking is an area of expertise. It's it's very deep, and um, you know I can't claim to know very much about it. Uh, Matthias has written books. He has a website. He has this really cool tool where you can actually go to any, um, you know, you can actually uh, drill into. A, a view of the world and pick a country and see all the open banking regulations and the timelines. Um, so he really he really knows what he's talking about. And I would encourage you to attend his talk if you want to know more about open banking and APIs in open banking. Um, it's not something I'm an, I'm an expert on. 
great great well thank you so then tomorrow that's the session so i encourage everybody to to check that out then the last question is for for you Anne marie so as we're wrapping up this um can you talk a little about the api journey for software ag and what the next steps are for for you and, and the team yeah thanks Janneke. Um, Software AG's web methods platform started out as an integration platform. And we added SOA governance. You know, you remember SOA. It came before it came before APIs, and we added SOA and REST services around 2008. And then we got serious about APIs with an API gateway and a portal about five or six years later. And then, you know, things began to move to the cloud. Um, so we moved our API gateway to the cloud, the same software, whether it's deployed on premise or whether you're a cloud tenant. Um, and then we started to build out that, that cloud capability. So our, our iPaaS now includes not just creation of APIs and the gateway, but integration, even B2B capabilities using protocols like um, Swift and EDI and recently managed file transfer. And then um, earlier I was talking about how, um, you know, when you're building apps in the cloud and you're using microservices because they can be containerized and they can be scaled and, um, you know, they, they function really well in the cloud. Um, and you're trying to figure out how to manage those microservices based applications. Um, last year we created a tool called App Mesh, which is an offering that lets you manage microservices and service meshes together with your APIs from a central place. Um, so that was a that was a sort of a big leap forward. Um, and now we're reinventing the developer portal as Marich was discussing today. Mm -hmm. And next year we're going to uh, be introducing some innovations around the control plane. Uh, so going back to that concept of you know, being able to operate in the cloud. So APIs, you know, they're they're here to stay. Um, they're a fundamental tool, whether you're doing digital transformation or whether you're modernizing and trying to expose data from legacy applications at the same time as you're creating brand new agile cloud-based applications. Mm -hmm. They're a way to create composable applications. Um, and they're a way to sort of manage your move to the cloud in a controlled way where you don't have to just throw everything away and move everything to the cloud. You can use APIs to make sure that you have access to things that you want to keep, retain while you're creating brand new cloud facing capabilities. Um, so I guess that's it. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tough question, but um, mm -hmm. you know, our, our API journey is uh, really a, a key part of our roadmap at software AG and uh, we have lots of exciting and interesting things coming. Great. Well, thank you for the overview. I'm sure it's a big question, so that's a that's a good um, roadmap for for the future. Um, we're going to wrap up this session now, but thank you to both Anne Marie and Marich for an interesting conversation, and thanks for everybody who who joined and and uh, chimed in on the on the roundtable. I wish you everybody you. A, a nice um, rest of the afternoon. Go and check out some of the other sessions. There's interesting roundtables and and live speakers on the on the stage. So yeah, thank you again, both of you, and have a good rest of the day for you. You're calling in from the states. <laughs>